Hi, kids, I'm still Bob the Tomato. And I'm still Archibald Asparagus, sat up tight Asparagus. And of course, I will always be a cantankerous decorative gourd. And a very old grape from Brooklyn. You know, I was, uh, the new owners of VeggieTales, actually, we wrote something. Uh, th the storyline behind Pa Grape was that he was a grape from Brooklyn. That's why he talked like that. And the new, the new owners of VeggieTales in a book, it said, I'm a grape from Brooklyn. And they said, you know what? That makes it sound like he's Jewish. Can we change that? And so now he's from the South or something. It was very bizarre. I was like, oh, come on, guys. He's from Brooklyn, let him be. Anyway, I'm still from Brooklyn, regardless of what the children's books tell you. Um, hi, how are you? Good, great. <laughs> it's good to be back. I was here a year ago, I believe, something like that, nine, ten months. Um, and I talked about dreams, if, in case you don't remember. Um, I told a story about me and building VeggieTales and building Big Idea Productions, which was my dream and how it was all coming true and then how unexpectedly it all fell apart, uh, collapsed into bankruptcy and I found myself uh, alone asking God why that all happened and he started to show me uh, some really important lessons, which I, which I told you about last time, that it's very easy for a dream to become an idol if it is something you don't think you can live without, if you don't think you can let go of it. Anything you are unwilling to let go of is an idol. And I realized that my good work had become an idol that defined me and God let it all fall apart. Um, so I told you last time about, okay, well this is my process and this is how I got to the point where I could actually let go of my goals and my dreams and just rest in God. And as I was traveling and giving that talk, I would have, you know, this was a few years ago, I'd have people come up to me and say, okay, so I'm doing that now. You know, I'm, I'm letting go, I'm resting, I'm rest, just walking with God. So how do I live now? How do I actually do work for him without, you know, making things idols, without going back to the, the, the old way? And uh, I realized, oh, I think I need another talk. I think there's a part two to this. There was the, you know, why should I let go of my ambitions and my drive and my will to do great things for God. And then the second part is, then what? How do I live? And this part is about, it's not about dreams, it's about burdens. Um, which doesn't sound quite as fun as dreams, but it's, it's actually better, trust me. So over the last few years, I've been speaking a lot to, uh, especially like children's ministry conferences where you have a gazillion, you know, Sunday school teachers in a room like this. and and you're trying to cheer them up, um, try, try to get them back on their feet again. Or uh, like Christian film conferences where you've got budding young Christian filmmakers that want to go out and change the world by making movies just like I did. Um, and I notice when I'm talking to these groups that the people that are looking back up at me look tired. Uh, they look really exhausted. They look like they're living on the edge of burnout. I mean, if you're a Sunday school teacher, if you're a children's ministry worker, you're locked in the church basement without natural light. You, you are in a room with four-year-olds and you're a glorified babysitter. And the only time anyone ever talks about what you do is if it goes poorly. Uh, which is most of the time. You don't necessarily see the results of what you're doing, and you don't get a lot of positive feedback. It's, it's tough work. And if you're a Christian filmmaker, the vast majority of Christian filmmakers have never actually successfully been allowed to make a film. Okay, this is discouraging because you start out with great dreams and aspirations of changing the world with your $100 million movie idea, and then you realize 10 years later that it probably isn't going to happen. And so I'm talking with people that are discouraged and kind of, you know, are living on the edge of burnout. They're tired of, of just trying over and over again. And I realize they look a lot like I did about 10 or 15 years ago, tired, living on the edge of burnout. It was 1997, I think, we had just finished um, 
Madam Blueberry uh, was the, the video. <laughs> yeah, give it up for Madam Blueberry. She's, she's listening in from somewhere. Um, and we just had a dinner, a celebratory dinner when we finished the, the video. And I was driving home that night and I started to get chest pain. And I ignored it because that's, you know, that's my way. Um, I went to bed that night and about two in the morning I could not sleep and my chest was hurting so much. So I got up, I didn't actually even wake up my wife. I got up and got in the car and drove to the hospital. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't recommend that if you're, if you're married. That's not gonna win you points. Um, and within about, oh, a minute of walking into the emergency room, I found myself on my back on a gurney in a little uh, alcove underneath a sign that said critical. And a nurse came over to me and I said, you know, kind of in my flippant way, well, why does that say critical? <laughs> and she looked at me and said, because you're critical. <laughs> and she wasn't laughing. Um, they thought I was having a heart attack. It turned out when they finally got, this was like four in the morning by now, when they finally got a uh, cardiologist awake to look at the EKGs, he said, no, he's not having a heart attack, it's something else. And they did more studies and discovered that I had pericarditis. Pericarditis is a viral infection in the lining of your heart, where, where the area around your heart, there's an infection and it starts to build up with fluids and puts pressure on your heart. And eventually, if you don't do anything, it'll kill you. Um, but they, they know if they find it, they know what to do. So they put you on heavy antibiotics and it takes care of it. And I was in bed for about two weeks. And then, but they were, I'm in to the doctor afterwards with my wife and my wife says, so how do you get pericarditis? And uh, the doctor looked at her and said, is he under much stress? I was under so much stress. Uh, the next year I got strep throat. The year after that I got shingles, which is a, an infection that uh, usually strikes the very old or the very ill. Um, I was working myself to death. I finally was having so much trouble that I started Christian counseling. I started going to a counselor just to figure out why am I doing so poorly. And one of the days I, I was supposed to go in and talk to the counselor happened to be the day of the Columbine shootings. Um, and I was sitting in the parking lot listening to the news on the radio, the latest report on how many kids had been killed in that high school shooting. And I walked into the counselor and he could see that I was upset and I said, well, you, have you heard the latest? Have you heard how, how bad it is? And he said, yeah, but he was pushing on why, how it was affecting me. He said, what, what are you feeling? And I thought about it for a minute and immediately tears came to my eyes and I said, I could have done something about that. I said, if, if only I had done more faster. If only, you know, the, the, the kids that did this were so affected by the media. And if I, and I'm trying to fix the media. If only I had worked harder and done more faster, maybe the media they were consuming wouldn't have been so toxic and maybe this wouldn't have happened. And the counselor stared at me and said, wow, that's quite a burden to carry. I said, yeah, it is. I was carrying an immense burden to single-handedly save the world, to make a difference, to offset the evil streaming out of Hollywood into living rooms across the country, to do as much as I could, as fast as I could. It was the first thing I thought about when I got up in the morning, and it was the last thing I thought about when I went to bed at night. And it was making me miserable. It was killing me. I was not a happy person. And then something interesting happened. I was uh, sitting next to my wife in bed one night reading Paul's letter to the Galatians and came upon that section about the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And I think for the first time in my life, it occurred to me what Paul meant by that. You know, I mean, I was familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. I think I had to memorize them in Awana for a, a badge or something. But I'd always looked at it as an obligation, you know, as a duty. If you are a Christian, you have to act loving. You have to act joyful. You have to be kind and patient and self-controlled. I looked at it like homework. Oh, great, something else I have to do. But now I saw what Paul 
really meant. If you are filled with the Spirit, these attributes will flow out of you whether you want them to or not. For an apple tree, producing apples is not an obligation. It it can't be helped. No apple tree ever accidentally produces grapes and says, oh, I'm such an idiot. An apple tree produces apples because it is an apple tree. In the same way, the Holy Spirit produces the fruit of the Spirit in a believer because He is the Holy Spirit of God. If someone is filled with the Spirit, these attributes will fall out of you naturally and effortlessly. It can't be avoided. I turned to my wife and said something that startled her. I don't think I'm a Christian. Not what she expected to hear from her creator of VeggieTales husband. I read her the fruit of the Spirit and then said, none of these are coming out of me. I'm not joyful. I have no peace. I'm not filled with love. I am stressed. I am cranky. I am fatigued. I am anxious. And none of those are on the list. (laughs) Something is wrong with me. Something was wrong with me, but I didn't know what. Then if you were here last time, you heard what happened next. My world fell apart. I lost my business, my characters, my ministry, the edifice I had built around myself, my means for making a difference, for saving the world from evil. God stood back and let it all fall away. And then He showed me what I had done, how I had made the work I was doing for Him more important than my relationship with Him. He showed me how miserable I had become, how I was carrying this burden, dragging this boulder up a hill that He never intended me to carry, a burden, in fact, that only He could carry. Only one person has ever lived who could actually save the world, and His name wasn't Phil. So I gave up that burden. I let it go. I put down the rock I had heaved for so long, and I rested. And I read the Bible, and I prayed, and I felt God's love for me, a love so strong, He was willing to let everything I was doing for Him fall apart to save me from myself. That freaked me out. The great works I was doing for God weren't as important to Him as I was. Wow. Then pretty soon the fruit of the Spirit started popping up, like like daffodils poking up through the snow. I felt peace. I felt joy. I felt love. My wife noticed. She liked it. (laughs) I spent a few months like this after the collapse of my ministry, reading the Bible, praying, feeling God's love for me. I wrote a couple of children's books, one about God's love but I didn't do much else. I sort of felt like an executive after a nervous breakdown, shuffling around the house in a bathrobe and slippers, waving at the neighbors with a goofy grin. (laughs) Or like a star race car driver in rehab after a huge crash, sitting at home with a Fisher-Price plastic steering wheel, pretending to drive. It was restful. It was peaceful. But I thought, Is this it? Am I done now? Will I just spend the rest of my life writing a few children's books, shuffling around in my slippers? It was great not to feel so burdened, but but was this it? And then something happened at the park. I'd taken a little office near my home. I could walk to it, actually. And near the office was a little park. And so some days, if the weather was nice, I'd go to a little deli in our neighborhood and buy a sandwich and shuffle down to the park in my bathrobe and my slippers and sit on a park bench and and eat my sandwich. And one day, it was a beautiful spring day, and the trees were blooming, and I'm sitting there with my sandwich. And two little girls ran across in front of me. They were sisters, like five and three. And they were climbing on things, and they were running around the fountain, and they were jumping over, you know. And then their mom came along behind them, and she was a young mom, and she looked a little stressed, and she's pushing the stroller, and she's trying to keep up, and she was trying to keep them safe and trying to keep them out of trouble. And I looked at her, and my heart really went out for her, because I have kids. You know, I know what it's like to raise girls. And and I know that those two little girls, two, three and five, in just a heartbeat, we're going to go from Blue's Clues to Jersey Shore. <laughs> they were going to go from Jimboree to Abercrombie and Fitch. And in a heartbeat, those little innocent smiles would change to the jaded looks of 13, 14-year-old girls that know their only value in this world is their ability to attract the opposite sex. And my heart went out for that mom. 
because I knew what she was up against. And I thought, I want to help her. I want to, what could I do to help make it easier for her? And I thought, well, this world is so brand dominated. Everything is about brands. And, and couldn't I make a brand that would, that would mean that it was good? It was just trustworthy. And anything from this brand that she would know would be good for her girls. And then suddenly in an instant, I realized that's what Big Idea was supposed to be. That, that's... That's why I started in the first place. And suddenly, all the lawyers and the bankruptcy and the, and the weeping and the gnashing of teeth and the marketing meetings was all just washed away, and I could see all the way back to the beginning, to me in high school on the couch, feeling a call from God to tell stories that could spread His truth. And I thought, mm -hmm. okay, God, you just spent four months getting me to let go of this burden. Are you telling me to pick it up again? Now I was really confused. So I decided to go back to Paul, the guy talking about peace, joy, love, granola. <laughs> what was Paul's life really like? Is he shuffling around in his slippers eating sandwiches in the park? Uh, in his letter to the second letter to the church in Corinth, he says, five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false brothers. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. That sounds miserable. That sounds like me, like at the, the peak of lying in the emergency room under the sign that said critical. Why wasn't Paul miserable? Why didn't these burdens crush him? How could he be filled with peace, joy, and love in the midst of all this? This is the guy that wrote the book of Philippians, called the book of joy, because like 21 times he says, rejoice. I, once again, I say rejoice, rejoice. <laughs> Why? I was looking for clues and I found my first clue in the book of Colossians where he says, we proclaim him admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end, I labor, struggling with all my energy, which is so, oh, wait a minute, struggling with all his energy, which so powerfully works in me. Okay, so maybe Paul isn't exhausted because he isn't using his own energy. He's using Christ's energy. Okay, how does that work? Now I'm really curious. Uh, in a letter to the Galatians, he says, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Then a few chapters later, he says, may I never boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Hmm. What Paul seems to be saying is that he's not using his own energy because he's dead. He has died with Christ and is instead alive through Christ, and it is Christ's energy that is doing all this work and doing all this struggling. Is Paul loony? Does Jesus know about this? Let's take it to the big guy himself. Okay, uh, Mark, Gospel of Mark, talks about Jesus looking out at a crowd and gives what is perhaps the strangest invitation of all time. If you've ever heard your pastor give this invitation, I will give you $5. Um, Mark 8, 38, Jesus says, and he who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. And we, you know, modern Westerners would say, all right, I got my cross, where are we going? Where? Where we hope it's fun. If you lived then, if you were a first century Palestinian in the Roman Empire, you knew exactly where you were going if you were carrying a cross. You were going to die. What Jesus is saying here is come on, everyone, pick up our crosses, we're all going to die. 
What does it mean to take up your cross and follow Christ? Where are you going? To die. We lose our lives. We let go of them. Jesus continues by saying, he who has found his life will lose it, and he who has lost his life for my sake will find it. Jesus is asking every believer to give up his life. So what exactly is Christ asking us to let go of? Our goals, our dreams, our ambitions, our burdens. We exchange them. Instead of pursuing our goals, we pursue Christ. Instead of following our hearts, we follow Christ's heart. And finally, we exchange our worldly burdens for Christ's burden. But is that a good trade? I mean, we're still burdened, right? How could there be a good burden? Well, Paul writes about the difference between godly sorrow and worldly sorrow in 2 Corinthians when he says, worldly sorrow brings death, but godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So could there be burdens that come from the world and a burden that comes from Christ? Well, let's check this out. Another case, uh, the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is looking out at another crowd, people that probably like us are looking a little tired a little worn out, and he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Notice that he doesn't say, come to me and you will have no burden. He says, come to me and I will put my yoke upon you. I will take your burdens and replace them with mine. The key I was looking for, the key to living the life that Paul models for us is accepting Jesus' invitation to lose our lives in Him, to let go of worldly burdens and accept Christ's burden. Now, this isn't about salvation. This isn't let go of your burden and your sins will be forgiven. Salvation is a different issue. This is, this is Christ calling us to abundant life. This is the abundant life that we're supposed to get after salvation. So what's the difference between worldly burdens and Christ's burden? Well, let's talk about some worldly burdens that you guys might have if you are, say, alive and American and evangelical. Um, any of you have the burden of expectations? You know, this is a good school. It's not cheap to be here. Your parents might be paying for it. Do you feel any expectation in how this is all supposed to go, how it's supposed to turn out? Do you have expectations for your own grades, your own performance? Can you let those go? They can get heavy. What about outcomes? Do you have the burden of outcomes? That's when we start thinking about, I want to do X in, the, in Y time to Z scale. I want to be this big by this time. I want to be in Congress by the age 35. I want to start a megachurch by the age 40. I want to have eradicated poverty from Uganda by the time I'm 27 and a half. I, I, I want to. Those are burdens that we put on ourselves, burdens of outcomes. God doesn't call us to outcomes, He calls us to obedience. He simply calls us to do what He's laid in front of us one day at a time. Can you let go of outcomes? What about ego? Anyone have the burden of ego? I do. Okay, so big idea fell apart. I lost everything. This was fun. Uh, after the bankruptcy, everything was sold to a company in New York City, and they moved it all to Nashville, Tennessee, because apparently that's where all the Christians live now. <laughs> so I flew out to New York, and I met with the new owners, and I said, okay, I'll run it for you. I'll, be, I'll go on as the, you know, CEO. And they said, um, we spent too much to let you run it. And they're like, oh, ouch. Okay, so I went back home. I was a little mad. But then I thought, okay, okay, I'll be, you know, I'll be humble, I'll be Christian. And I came back and said, okay, 
I'll just be the chief creative officer. I'll be the guy, you know, who's making all the creative choices because that's really, that's me, that's who I am, that's really what you need, right? And they said, they looked kind of awkwardly at each other, and as two guys, and then they said, um, we just gave that job to someone else. And I thought, oh, really? And I went back home, and I got mad. It's like, oh, you, you really think you can do this without me? Well, fine, you go ahead, we will see how this goes, and when it goes horribly, and when it's all burning, and everyone says, we don't like the veggies anymore, don't come crying to me, because I told, and then I thought, no, oh, I'm trying to be a Christian, I should pray about this. <laughs> so I stopped, and I prayed, and I was having my devotions one day, I hadn't gotten back to them yet, and I was reading through Jeremiah, and I don't think I'd actually ever done that before, because, you know, Jeremiah. I was reading through Jeremiah, and I got to Jeremiah chapter 29, which is an interesting chapter because like half the Israelites have been carried off into exile in Babylon. All their precious things, everything that's important to them has been carried off by pagans to this pagan city. And I thought, wow, that's what happened to me, except no, Nashville isn't pagan, but it's weird. And so I thought, okay. so. That's, what does he say? And so Jeremiah writes a letter to the Israelites in exile in Babylon telling them how to live. And I'm like, oh, what does he say? He say, you know, stick it to the man. Don't go along with them. Don't, you know, fight the power. He says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And I thought, oh, crap. <laughs> you want me to help them. And that's what I've been doing for the past seven years now. I do voices. I give notes on scripts. They don't have to take the notes on scripts. They can put them in the paper shredder, which I think sometimes they do. But I said, was it, okay, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll help out. I'll be a consultant. I'll do whatever you want. But, but every time you make a dollar off the stuff that I made, could I have like two pennies? And they went, hmm, um, okay. And they've made a lot of dollars off the stuff I made, and it's added up to a lot of pennies. And everything I have launched since that day, uh, What's in the Bible, the DVD series for kids, Jelly Telly, the website, I mean, all the stuff I'm doing has been paid for by those pennies I got from VeggieTales. And I realized in hindsight, if I hadn't let go of my ego, I would have missed out on God's work of provision for the next chapter of my ministry. Do you have an ego? If you don't, please come up so we can all worship you, but <laughs> can you take your ego, put it on the altar, kill it? Can you nail it to the cross and walk away? And then finally, do you have anything you're carrying around from childhood? No? Okay, good. I'll go on. Um, I absolutely love my dad. He's really, really creative. And when I was little, he was my hero. He was an advertising executive and he, he shot TV commercials with race cars in Baja, Mexico. And it was the coolest thing. And I wanted to be just like him. And I, he was, worked for a tire company and I made up my own fictitious tire company when I was like seven years old so I could cut out my own fictitious ads from his ads and be my own little mini seven-year-old advertising executive, just like my dad. And then, one day when I was nine years old, he came down the stairs with a suitcase in his hand and he kissed me on the forehead and he walked out the door. And in an instant, my life split into two halves, the half before my dad left and the half after my dad left. And as much as just that part of it hurt, what hurt worse was the message I took from watching my dad walk out. Because I knew that apparently marriage took work. I mean, my parents did not look like they were having much fun. They weren't smiling at each other very much anymore. So it, it was clear to me, even as a you know, nine-year-old, that marriage apparently is hard. But I saw my dad look at that hard work 
And then I saw him look at me, and I saw him decide that it wasn't worth it. And what I took inside was that I'm not worth it, not worth the hard work, not worth hanging around for. And that belief affected me for the next 20 years of my life. It affected my relationships, it affected my company, it affected my employees, it it affected everything I touched. So that even, you know, 20 years later at the peak of the success of VeggieTales, I was sitting in a hotel in Los Angeles, got a call on uh, on the phone and it was Time Magazine who wanted to do an interview with me about VeggieTales. Even at that, like, shining moment, there was still a little voice inside me saying, now? Am I worth it? You know, now? Have I done enough? Am I worth hanging around for? And that was something that God had to go to work on with me, through my wife, through some other friends, to get me to the point <clears throat> of saying, what my dad did hurt a lot. But was I ready to take it to the cross, nail it on the cross and walk away from it? Was I ready to forgive him and move on? The thing about the world's burdens is they're very loud. They're like a guitar amp on 11. They drown out anything else God could possibly be trying to say to you. Christ's burden is quiet. It's a burden simply of obedience. Christ is calling you All you who are weary and burdened, bring your burdens to the cross and lay them down. Let them go. Then stay there at the cross. For me, this was about six months of just staying at the cross and resting in God's love. Not His love for the world in abstract, but His very real love for you. So I'm back at work now, launching new ideas, brainstorming new solutions, serving and ministering with the gifts I've been given. And I look for those that I have a burden for, like those two little girls in the park. They say, all right, there's, I think I can do something about that. But free from ego, free from the baggage of my childhood, free from expectations about, well, how many kids am I going to help and how fast? How much? How big? How impressive? There are days where I'll still start to get stressed over my plans, my schedules, my budgets, and stress will start creeping up my legs like a virus, reminding me that while I am created in the image of God, I still bear the marks of a fallen humanity. But in those moments, I go back to the words of Paul, I go back to the cross, I go back to the purity of my burden for those two little girls and their mom staring down a horribly messy world. I let go of that stress and I put my plans and my schedules and my budgets and my dreams and my goals in God's hands. And once again with Paul can say, rejoice. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. So rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you once again for the opportunity to stand in this spot, um, in this place, for this university, for the calling to be impactful, for the calling to shine your light into dark places, to fight the good fight, to run the good race, to someday hear you say, well done, good and faithful servant. But let us beware of our dreams, our goals, our ambitions, our egos, and our burdens. Let us be willing to name them and nail them to the cross and walk away from them so that we can be filled with your yoke which is easy, your burden which is light, and your peace, joy, and love which are the reasons the world is drawn to us in the first place. Thank you for the opportunity to share this truth and I pray um, that it would not return empty. In your son's name, amen.